All right, so we're going to start a lecture on birds. Um, hopefully you learned a little bit about them on your investigation stations on Friday. Is it on Friday? Um, so hopefully you'll learn a little bit more, and maybe this will help you also with your bird posters uh, and your feather lab. So the first thing we're going to start out talking about is their internal anatomy before we talk about behaviors. Um, so most birds have the same basic anatomy. There are some differences with their digestive systems um, because of what they eat, but as far as their um, basic anatomy, it's pretty similar. Um, there are some digestive differences, but here are some anatomy terms that I would like you to know, so you may want to write these down in your journal. Um, the gizzard is where um, you're going to find grit, and that's how they grind up their food when they eat it because birds don't have teeth, so they eat it, and it goes down into their gizzard, which then gets ground up. Okay, The cloaca is where sperm is deposited and eggs are laid from, uh, so this is just an area, like uh, an opening in the body in the reproductive tract. Okay, the crop is like a storage pouch, so when they eat something, if they don't want to eat it immediately, it can be stored in the crop. Okay, and then the vent is the excretory opening, uh, which is actually near the cloaca. So hopefully you have your diagram sheet and you'll want to fill in the blanks on that sheet using this. So um, the gizzard is here. Okay, it's kind of the stomach area. Here's the crop right here. And then... Um, here is the cloaca, and the vent is actually right close to it. The cecum and the vent should be right here, okay? Now, hollow bones are going to allow them to fly. You probably learned that in, like, third grade. But um, they have this, like, networking of uh, calcium deposits that still give the bone structure and integrity, but also make it more light so that the birds can fly. And then you can see the bones down here on the bottom, um, and they're all pretty much the same for all birds. Um, you won't need to know this, um, but it's just important to understand that birds do have a different anatomy than humans do, obviously, because they look different. So when we talk about the reproduction, they are, they reproduce reproduce sexually like all other animal, most other animals. Um, sperm is put into the cloaca, that's the the opening for the female cavity in birds. Okay, and this is also where the females lay their eggs from. Okay. Um, and all birds are oviparous. And oviparous just means that they lay eggs and they have an amniotic egg. Okay. And ov oviparous is laying eggs where then it's incubated and hatched. And then an amniotic egg um, is an egg that's protected by a hard or leathery shell. So anything that has an amniotic egg would be like um, lizards, amphibians, birds, um, and echidnas, and platypus. Okay, so let's talk about our different types of birds, okay? So, most songbirds are small. We do have a few larger ones, but they're, they're mainly going to be pretty small. Um, and they have different songs or calls that identify them. Um, some are going to be sexually dimorphic, and that just means that they look different. So the males and the females are going to look different. And some of them are monomorphic, which means they look exactly the same. Um, Songbirds are mainly going to have pairs in which both the male and the female take care of the young, okay? And they can, they're usually going to be prey for larger species of birds. Uh, they can be prey for snakes, um, small or small carnivorous mammals like foxes or bobcats if they can catch them. Um, if you've ever seen the startlings over the Great Salt Lake or anywhere really they you know that songbirds are going to exhibit flocking behavior and that's when they do when they come together as a flock and they move around and they fly around and they kind of make, make these in, intricate patterns okay they're herbiv herbivores or insectivores which means that they either eat grasses and seeds or they eat insects um and most songbirds are going to mate for one breeding season for with one individual so that means that the next season they'll they'll breed with another individual so they are seasonally monomorphic. So that means that they pick a mate for the season and they breed and they're faithful to that mate for that season, but then the next season they'll breed with another one and so on and so forth. So this is an example of sexually dimorphic birds. So you can see these cardinals here. The female cardinal is on the right and the male cardinal is on the left. Um, and they look different. So you would be able to tell which one is the male and the female. 
All right, so birds of prey, these are things like owls, hawks, um, kites. I'll think of some more in a minute. Eagles. Um, and they are usually monomorphic. They usually look the same, the males and females. It's very hard to tell the difference between the two of them. Um, they have a really good eyesight. They prey on small mammals and other birds. Um, and lots, most, of bird, most birds of prey create nests called aries. And they come back to them every year and make them bigger. And they can weigh up to like 200 pounds, which is insane. Um, they're solitary. They don't practice grouping behaviors. So you're not going to see them. You're not going to see eagles flying around in a flock. They don't really need to because a flocking behavior is usually a um, protection strategy because songbirds are normally prey, whereas birds of prey are, are predators. And so they don't really need flocking behavior because that is more of a protection mechanism and they don't need that. Um, some birds of prey can uh, will mate for life. They're mono monogamous, which means that they find a mate and they that they live with that mate or are faithful to that mate for their entire lives. Um, bald eagles are a good example of that, but most are going to mate for one breeding season and they'll find a new mate the next breeding season. So it's seasonally monomorphic. Um, owls are going to eat small mammals whole and they cough up the leftover materials into an owl pellet. Now hawks and other birds of prey will also do that, but their their pellets look different and we'll talk about that at the end of this PowerPoint. So here are just some examples. It's a bald eagle here. This is a great horned owl. Um, owls are really interesting. They're different than a lot of other birds of prey because of their structure. They can turn their head uh, about 180 degrees, maybe 260, between 180 and 260 degrees. Um, and their their eyesight is just peculiar, peculiarly, just very peculiar because they can see really well at night um, and they're nocturnal. All right, game birds. These, for those of you who are hunters, you probably know and have seen game birds, you know what they are, turkeys, partridge, dove, quail, so anything you're going to hunt. Um, they're usually, they're generalists, they'll eat anything that's available to them, whether that be insects, grasses, seeds, um, pretty much anything that they can find. Um, and they're mainly omnivores, so they'll, that, that is the trademark of a generalist, if they're omnivores. Um, most game birds are going to practice roosting behavior, so you're going to find them in a tree roosting together, um, and that's also a, uh, defense mechanism because pa there's power numbers. Um, so they congregate at night to sleep. Uh, and then turkeys and sage grouse also practice what's called lecking behavior. And a lek is just an area where males will practice breeding behaviors and their mating dances. Because almost all game birds are polygynous, which means that they breed with multiple females in a breeding season. So turkey is a really good example of the sage grouse. Um, quail, woodcocks, they are all, they have lecking, they have lex. Um, and... A specific population of, let's say, sage grouse is dependent on the lek. And so if the lek disappears, if this if this area, this lek disappears, then the whole um, population, that whole population of sage grouse will die off. Because if they don't have their lek, then they can't breed. So pr pr protecting leks is a really important thing to do. And a lot of um, wildlife biologists who specialize in game birds will um, do a lot of studies on lecking areas and how to protect them, but also provide areas for humans. Um, okay, and then a, a group of a partridge is called a covey. So here are some pictures of game birds. We've got a turkey. Uh, this is a partridge up in the top. You guys probably are familiar with chuckers, which this is just the name. Of the, this is the North American version of a chucker. Um, chuckers are actually, I think, Hungarian. I'm not sure. I'll have to look it up. Um, and then this is a ringneck pheasant, which is a Eurasian species that was brought over uh, for hunting purposes. All right, so scavengers are another section we're going to talk about. Um, vultures, condors, buzzards, caracaras are also in this um, section. They also practice roosting behaviors. You guys have probably seen turkey vultures roosting in a tree before. Um, so they do practice that roosting behavior. Um, and their, de their defense mechanism is to vomit their food at any potential threat. Um, and it's disgusting because it is, they eat dead and decaying materials. It starts to get broken down in their stomach and then they barf, they barf it up. So it's gross. So that's how they protect themselves from potential predators. Um, now there are two different types of vultures. We've got black vultures and turkey vultures. Black vultures are going to be sight creatures. Um, and so they'll sometimes capture live prey. Um, they rely on their eyesight to find food. 
Turkey vultures are going to rely on their sense of smell. They have awesome sense of smell, really bad eyesight. Um, but they can pretty much find dead and decaying material like miles and miles away. It's like sharks finding uh, a wounded animal from miles away because there's blood in the water. It's kind of the same idea with vultures because their sense of smell is so incredible. Um, carrion is just a fancy word for dead and decaying organic material. So, like, if you see a dead skunk on the side of the road, that's technically carrion. It's just that we call it roadkill because, you know, that's what we call it. Um, all scavengers are bald from the neck up except caracaris, but they're all bald from the neck up to reduce the amount of bacteria in their feathers. I mean, if if all I eat is dead and decaying material, I certainly don't want to get the bacteria that's on that dead and decaying material in my feathers, which then can make me sick. Um, so that's why they're bald. That's why they look like old men with no hair. Um, and scavengers are keystone species. So we kind of talked about keystone species in our first unit when we did ecology, but they're keystone species because they help to reduce and incorporate dead and decaying material back into our natural system. So this can also reduce the occurrence of disease because they're getting rid of that bacteria and reincorporating that bacteria and these, these, this detritus back into the system. So they're really, really important. If we didn't have, um, if we didn't have scavengers and decomposers and detritivores, we would be in a bad way. So here are some examples. This bottom one is a California condor. We got turkey vultures up here on the right and then uh, black vultures on the left. Remember that black vultures are our sight creatures. Turkey vultures have a really terrible um, sense of sight, but you can actually see their nair. That's called a nary or a nair um, right above their beak. It's huge on the turkey vulture and that's because their sense of smell is just absolutely incredible. But if you look on the black vulture, it's not as big because they rely more on their eyesight than the turkey vultures do. But you can also see that they're bald. Okay. So waterfowl, we only have two sections left. We've got waterfowl and seabirds left, but most waterfowl are going to mate for one breeding season. Okay, they're adapted to water. They have webbed feet. Um, I guess you could sort of put these in a, the game bird category also because we shoot them and eat them, but... They are, they are different and they're adapted different from game birds. So that's why we put them in a different category. Um, there are two different types of waterfowl. You have dabbling and diving. Dabbling are adapted to shallow waters. So like swampy areas, estuaries, wetlands. And then you've got open water or diving ducks, which are adapted to deep waters. Sea ducks, um, open water ducks like teals, um, scoters, uh, ringnecks, grebes. So those are more of your, uh, going to be your open water ducks. They're mostly omnivorous. Some are going to eat fish, um, but they'll also eat plant material. Um, they're going to live in wetland areas. They create nests on the ground near shorelines or in trees near the water. A wood duck is really example, a good example of that. They'll actually nest in trees near a wetland. And most of them are dimorphic. So that means that you can tell the difference between the males and females. And generally that is a protection strategy because it's the females that sit on the eggs and so they need to be able to be camouflaged to make sure that small carnivorous mammals can't eat them like badgers, foxes, bobcats, things like that. So here are some pictures of ducks. We've got a cinnamon teal up in the left corner here. We've got, I think that's a canvas back in the right here. On the bottom left, that's a scoter. The very bottom is a coot, an American coot. And then we've got a buffle head um, between the red head or the um, canvas back and the uh, American coot. American coots are interesting. You probably see them everywhere, um, but they're actually more closely re related to chickens than they are ducks. All right, last one we'll talk about seabirds, um, but they these guys are adapted to ocean environments. Um, they eat fish and other saltwater organisms, so they're piscivores. P Pisa, Pisces is fish in Spanish. So piscivores, they practice roosting behavior. So they will roost. Um, some of them can be scavengers. Seagulls are a really good example of this. Um, they have smaller wings and more streamlined shape to fly over open water without getting tired because uh, they want to use those thermals, those ocean thermals. Um, and some are going to have long legs to walk in and out of the surf to find food. So like uh, piper, sandpipers, Gulls, they all have these long legs that allow them to walk in and out of the surf water and pick up like what we like to call sea lice um, and other crustaceans that may be in the surf as the ocean water comes up to the, to the shoreline. So we've got a frigate bird up here in the left. 
This is a California gull. And on the bottom is a sandpiper. All right, brood parasites. Okay, these are birds that lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Okay, brown-headed cowbirds, cuckoos, and black-headed ducks are the main uh, brood parasites that we know of. Um, they lay their eggs in another bird's nest, and they'll actually come back and check on their, their eggs. But if the host bird finds the egg and pushes it out of the nest, the parasitic birds, the brood parasites, will harass and even kill the host bird, and we call that mob behavior. So it's kind of crazy. They lay their eggs, they parasitize, and they lay their eggs in another bird's nest, but if the other bird's like, uh-uh, I don't want that in my nest, and tries to push it out, then that bird will come back and kill the host bird. On top of that, the demands of the parasitic bird, the, the young of the parasitic bird, will be so much that the host bird can, will die trying to feed the parasitic bird because it takes so much food. And sometimes the parasitic bird, the young of that parasitic bird, will grow faster than the host bird's young and will kill the other ones. They'll push them out of the nest. So that they will get all of the nutrients from the parents. So it's kind of crazy. Um, but it's interesting because right now we're having a problem with brood parasites. And the reason is because before we had fences and cows, we had buffalo. And buffalo just roamed across the plains. And these brood parasites followed these buffalo. And so they would only parasite a nest here and there. So it wasn't a big deal. But now that the buffalo are gone and we've fenced in cattle, these birds, these parasitic birds, can parasitize every single songbird nest in an area and make species of songbirds go extinct. So that's why we're having a problem with brood parasites now. So here's just some pictures. Um, this is a brown-headed cowbird on the left. This is a cuckoo on the right. Um, here's a cardinal feeding a brown-headed cowbird young. You can see that the young of the brown-headed cowbird is twice as big as the card adult cardinal. So you can see how much of a stress it would be on the parent. And then this is a robin's nest with a brown-headed cowbird egg in it. All right, so let's talk about feathers. Feathers allow birds to fly, but each feather has its own job, okay? There's several different types of feathers. We've got flight feathers, um, primary, secondary coverts, tertial, scapulars. The remicle is the pin feather, and the alula is the edge of the feather. So if you have your diagram, your feather diagram, you're going to want to um, fill out your wing structure here. So you see the alula here is the three outer edge feathers, and then the carpal edge is just the absolute edge of the top parts of the feathers. Then you've got your primary coverts, and these primaries are flight feathers, and so are these secondaries. And these feathers don't grow back. Once you pluck one out, it's gone, which is how you can actually clip a bird's wings. You just clip the feathers, the flight feathers, so they can't fly. Um, and then these coverts are just protectors for where these primary flight and secondary flight feathers come into the actual wing itself. Okay, so here's just what it looks like on a bird. Okay, so you can see as a bird's flying, this is kind of how all of these feathers work together. Okay, so let's look at an individual feather. We have the rachis, and the rachis is just the, the central vein. Okay, the calamus is the edge where it comes into the actual fed, like the actual wing and, and fits in. Okay, or we could also call it the quill, because that's the part you would write with if you made it out of a pen. Okay, the plumulaceous is the very fuzzy stuff, and that's used for insulation. The pinaceous is where it looks like pins, so up here this would be the pinaceous. This is the plumulaceous section. This is for insulation. It's the fuzzy part. Okay. The anterior vein is going to be the outer edge. The posterior vein is going to be the inner edge. And then the notch is where it would fit in with another feather. So it would lay right on top of the other one. Okay. So I put this picture up here and made it a little bit bigger so that you can fill out your feather diagram. So if you need to pause it, go ahead and pause it. Write it down make sure that you have it filled out because there will be questions on your quiz about the feathers. Okay, so our owl digestive system is different than other digestive systems, okay? They have a muscular stomach and a glandular stomach, okay? So the muscular stomach basically grinds it all up and then the glandular stomach has the digestive juices, but the digestive juices are really weak, so they can't really break down things the way that other 
birds can. And so all of the feather, all of the fur or the feathers or the bones that are left over from what they eat, they have to cough it up because it's too big to pass through the vent. And so uh, they don't, and they also don't have a crop, so there's no digestive juices in the crop to help break down what they've eaten. So it passes directly into the muscular stomach, which is called the proventriculus, okay? And then the second part of the stomach is the ventriculus or the, the gizzard. If you look back at the diagram on the first couple slides, you'll see that uh, ventriculus. So the ventriculus in an owl is where that owl pellet is going to be formed, okay? And since birds of prey lack a lot of digestive enzymes in their stomach, soft tissue can be digested, but fur, bones, feathers, they have to be expelled somehow, okay? And since an owl pellet blocks the digestive system, they can't eat anything until they until they regurgitate the pellet from the last meal that they ate. So owls only have a 2.5 pH in their stomach, and so that's why their, digest their digestive enzymes are just weak, and so they have a higher amount of residue as opposed to a hawk, which has a higher or a lower pH and can digest those um, the prey items more efficiently. So uh, on the back side of your paper, you have the owl digestive system. Flip that over, label it. So pause this, label it. But you can see here's your proventriculus here. Here's your ventric ventriculus. So no crop. So when they eat it, it goes directly into the proventriculus, into the crop, or into the, the ventriculus, and then they have to barf it back up, basically. All right, so here's our hawk digestive system, okay? Hawks are able to digest bones of their prey a little bit better. So when they cough up pellets, they're generally very small. It depends on the size of the bird, but it can be about the length of your pinky finger or smaller. Um, but they're able to, to digest more material and their digestive enzymes are just a little bit stronger, so they're able to um, digest more of their prey, prey material. So you can see this, I think this might be a swain, um, I'm not really sure what kind of hawk this is, but you can see that it is regurgitating a pellet. So that's it for our bird lecture. Make sure you have your paper filled out and um, finish up your bird poster and your feather lab and I will be checking your journals the next time you're in class.